All right, everybody, welcome back. I am so excited to get back to live recording of the RICO 12 speaker meeting. Thank you all for your continued support support during the month of December as I released a bunch of old episodes on recovery from the previous podcast I did called Journey Through Life. That journey and recovery series that I shared with the RICO 12 audience is what inspired the launch and growth of RICO 12. My name is Justin, and I am a son of God and an addict, and grateful to my higher power and to you, the listening audience, that I can do this service that means so much to me. And it seems it means a lot to many of you out there. Today for me, and I'm taking this lead from Robert, he and I had a conversation earlier this week, and he challenged me to do this in meetings that I attended this week. Today for me is day 2,758 of sobriety, one day at a time, and I am beyond grateful for that miracle today. Welcome to RICO 12. RICO 12 is an organization with the mission of learning and sharing the similarities of addiction of all kinds and gaining and sharing tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We come together from all places, all faiths, and all backgrounds to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. Speakers from our uh, past meetings have represented many fellowships and identify with addictions with such variety as alcoholism, drugs, food, sex, gambling, theft, codependency, and all of the Anon groups, just to name a few. We invite recovering addicts with at least one year sobriety and who are actively working their recovery in their respective fellowships to share their experience strength and hope on a live zoom webinar each Friday at noon central time for 20 to 25 minutes. Then we, the live audience get the opportunity to ask questions of that speaker for another 20 to 25 minutes. If you are hearing this meeting in recorded podcast form and would like to participate as a live audience member in the future, please go to rico12.com. That's R E C O one, com to learn more and to submit your email address there to receive weekly invitations. Rico 12 is a self-supporting service. And we appreciate your help in keeping us working our 12th step in this manner. We gratefully accept contributions and I'll put information as to how you can contribute in the show notes of the podcast, as well as in the chat of the live meeting. Uh, This is meeting number 145. What a miracle that we're pressing along that way. Uh, We also have a growing and active WhatsApp community. If you'd like to be added there, please send an email with your WhatsApp number to rico12pod at gmail.com. That's R E C O. 12pod at gmail.com get you added in there and we look forward each week to receiving the light reflected from our speakers that light inspires hope meaning worth and growth in us the listening audience now i'll introduce our guest speaker for today robert p whose topic is going to be alone versus lonely in recovery here's a little bit about robert He first came into recovery on february 9th 1986 and met a group of people who had changed his life After a short relapse, Robert came back to recovery on April 25th of 1986 and has been clean and sober ever since. Robert's mission is to become more well and to encourage others along the way. Uh, Robert, I'm grateful to call you a friend, not just a recovery buddy, but a friend. Take it away. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, and if your audience could see my smile, it would be... uh evidence of our friendship. And, uh, and as I previously stated, uh, you know, watching young men and women like you rise up in the recovery community is, is, is a blessing that, that I could never express because someday I won't be here, you know, just as my sponsor and Texas Mike and Abe and Doc Irv and, and all of the ones who taught me um, our past Richard H and, and so on. Someday I won't be here. And recovery is going to rely on you and Wendy and Angie and Chaz and Tess and so many others and and Scotty B uh, to just to pick up that mantle. And so I'm very grateful uh, to be here today. And you know, the, the topic that you and I had discussed when we locked in this date a few months back is something that um, that I'm very aware of. Um, even, you know, we talk about days. Today is 13,405 days, which is crazy when, when you think about, and I remember what it was like the first day I walked in uh, into treatment and that isolation and that loneliness. 
But I think that's something that um, I think more so old, when we get older in sobriety that we really need to pay attention to um, because I still have an ego. Uh, my ego tells me that um, quantity is often more important than quality uh, and and they need to coexist and therefore quality uh, tells me that I need to continue to pursue that fulfilling life. And it's within life's fulfillment that I've been able to stay clean and sober for as long uh, as I have. And, and I think that's a universal truth. Um, even though quantity is an indicator of quality, um, we still need to continue to work the steps. Uh, that is why, you know, before I share a little bit more, that's why I'm a, a real proponent of 12-step recovery. Um, I still go to meetings. I still talk to my sponsor. I still read the big book. I still read the 12 and 12. Um, I still read my Bible. Um, I still practice these principles in all my affairs. Um, step 12 mandates, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to those addicted and to practice these principles in all our affairs. I can't get away from it. I can't, I can't share with you or with these individuals today without being a practicing member, because if not, that would make me a hypocrite. <laughs> and, and no one likes to be a hypocrite, especially those of us who are seeking truth. You know, when we talk about being alone and lonely, I don't think anyone experiences both of those combined than those of us who are trapped in addiction. Um, I envy those in a in a in a spiritual way, not in a jealous way. But I envy those who never had to experience them at the same time. You know, I I'm so grateful for the people who didn't lose their jobs and didn't lose their families and didn't lose their children and didn't lose the fellowship with their mom, their dad, their brothers and their sisters. You know, we we felt a sense of loneliness, but we never became alone. Many of us have, though. Um, you know, one of the things that you had mentioned uh, early on about being in a in a live venue with 50,000 people. I'll never forget back in 1974, I was with a group of people and we went to see Jethro Tull. And for those of you who are too young to know who Jethro Tull is, they were considered heavy metal back in the early seventies, uh, the way Metallica would be considered now. And I remember I was at the Hollywood Bowl, saw Rory Gallagher, Robin Trower and Jethro Tull. And I was high, man. I mean, I was probably eating peyote, smoking dope, drinking. I mean, I was high. And yet, and yet, I looked at the crowd, and I'll never forget this, Justin. I looked at the crowd, and I thought, how can I feel so lonely when I'm with 100,000 people? And I'll never forget that feeling. Now, that was 1974. I wouldn't get sober for 12 more years. But it's something I remembered in my recovery. It was an indication that something was wrong. Obviously, I, I blew right through that stop sign. And my life became even more uh, of a calamity and collapse. Um, but I'll never forget that feeling. And I remember individual after individual, just saying enough is enough. I was, I was lonely much before I was alone. And I wasn't lonely because I drank and used. I drank and used because I was lonely, you know, that feeling of isolation isn't something that is a result of addiction. Addiction is a result of that. That's 
That's my personal belief. You know, and you know my story. And by the time I came into recovery in February, I, I had already gone to Gamblers Anonymous in December of 1985. And when I came in to recovery, I realized I was addicted to pornography. I was a compulsive gambler. I, um, I was bulimic, compulsive overeater, and addicted to drugs and alcohol. All was done so I could displace that feeling of isolation, of being alone, of wondering why I would see other people achieve so much, and I wanted it just as much as they did. Nobody wanted to be a better husband more than me, or a better father, or a better son, or a better brother, or a better friend. And yet, it always seemed out of my grasp. I couldn't understand what was wrong with me. I was so lonely. I had such great despair that, as we talked about earlier, I'm, I'm amazed I wasn't successful in my suicide attempts. It was always passive. Because as I learned in recovery, it's not that I wanted to die. It's just I didn't know how to live. And the isolation was killing me. It was so bad, Justin, that I would have to get drunk before I went to a family gathering. Just so I wouldn't feel awkward. I used to get high in the handball courts in high school when I was 14 and 15 years old, drinking spinata, eating cross tops, eating second all, whatever was available, smoking dope, just so I could handle going to class that day. And I'm 15 years old. And I just, I wouldn't be alone. I would be with 40 or 50 kids. I was very athletic. I was in choir. And yet I was not alone. But there was just a loneliness and a despair. And I never felt like I fit. And over time, that pain that only loneliness can bring was like trying to swim in a riptide. You know, you can, you can fight against the current, you can fight against the tide, but eventually, the minute you think you have some air, you're sucked back down. And you're fighting over and over again. And you drink and you use and you act out just to displace that loneliness, just to tell yourself it'll be okay just this one time. And it and it comes on and it comes on and and it just increases. And and as the pain would increase, the addiction would increase as well, because as Father Martin says, it's a natural human response to escape relief from that which is uncomfortable. And no matter where I was uncomfortable from, it's why, you know, I became an adulterer with my sexual addiction. Some of the despicable things I did in acting out sexually, I'm, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed of. I'm forgiven, but I can't believe that I would do those things to such a wonderful wife who was so devoted and so committed to me. And yet when there's that component in you that tells you no matter how hard you try, you're always going to end up less than, it creates a, a loneliness and despair that very few people other than those of us who succumb to our addiction can, can feel. And I remember feeling so alone the morning I went into recovery on February 9th of 1986. And, and I realized it wasn't gambling. It wasn't sex. It wasn't, believe me, it wasn't anything. It said I couldn't drink. And I was an alcoholic. And that first admission was my introduction to fellowship 
because I made a phone call and after a number of attempts with no money, no insurance, I found a treatment center, Nevada Treatment Center in Las Vegas that would take me. And that was my first introduction into honesty of how alone and how afraid because fear comes with loneliness. That fear that no matter what we do, it's it's never going to get better. It's only going to get worse because that's the evidence. You know, as it says in the big book, over any considerable period, things get worse, never better. But that was my first introduction because I was introduced to a group of people through the fellowship of the program. You know, when I first came in, Justin, and, and to the rest of you in the audience, the preamble of Alcoholics Anonymous is read essentially before every meeting. And the first part of it says, Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that we might solve our common problem and to help others recover from alcoholism. When I heard... Justin, I tell people all the time, if that was the only thing I ever heard, I would have stayed. Because then and there, I realized how fellowship starved I was, how alone I was. And here was this people who didn't know me, who were glad that I was there. And for the first time in my life, I realized not only was I not alone, but I had no other reason to be lonely. And it just began to open a door for me. Obviously, honesty needs to come after that. And I wasn't capable, I was afraid. I used to be really afraid, I was, it was a real fear of mine that if you knew who I really was, I'd be the first person in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous that you would ask not to come back. I really believe that. And that scared me. It scared me so much that I was afraid to be honest with you because if you knew what I did and how despicable I was, you might think I was too sick for help. So I decided not to get honest. I decided just to tell you I had a higher power and I went through the motion of the steps. And, and I tell people that worked right up until I got drunk. But when I came back after my relapse, and I was very fortunate, number one, I came back. Not everyone does. The longer I've been sober, the more I realized that to be true. But I came back because I realized that I was alone and lonely again. And you had taught me in the rooms that I didn't have to be either. And I came back to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous on April 25th, 1986. And by the mercies and grace of God, 13,405 days later, you and I are having this conversation. Um, and my life has never been better. Um, I still practice. Um, not being alone because I'm very social, but it's okay if I'm alone. I'm semi-retired. I'm, I'm home a lot. I do a lot of things by myself and yard work and projects and things like that, but I'm not lonely because I, I walk in the realm of the spirit of a higher power that loves me far beyond that which I deserve. And the relationships that I choose to have today fulfill me in ways that I can only be eternally grateful for. So with that, um, let's talk. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for introducing that. I appreciate that, Robert. Um, grateful to have you here and, and discussing this thing. And we'll get into a conversation. And thanks for uh, the kind comments that are coming in from the live audience. If, a reminder to you guys, if you have a question for Robert, type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your window. We'll get to those as we go along. But yeah, so Robert, you and I, before we started recording, we had a little conversation about this a very topic. And, uh, and, and, and we talked about loneliness versus alone versus loneliness. 
Um, and, and the words that I've often used when I talk about this is isolation versus solitude. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you see the relationship in there? Do you see a relationship between those, those four terms and how do they interact and how do they differentiate? Well, you know, a, a great question because I, I found out, I used to think I was really stupid and I, and I think my life was characterized by a person who could only break things, never put things apart, uh, never, never put things together, only break them. And, and I had to re-identify and, and words, I love words because words have meaning. And, um, so breaking down these words is really important because it's easy to <clears throat> cross over it. It's easy to imply that one is indicative of another. <clears throat> and isolation um, is, is different from separation. And matter of fact, one of the one of the definitions or words, the cinnamons that go along with loneliness <clears throat> is a degree of isolation, standing apart. So I believe that alone is a physical sense, whereas loneliness is an emotional, psychological mental experience that that we have and like i previously stated i do a lot of things alone laura still works you know 60 hours a week i'm i work three days a week now i'm down to two days a week just just to keep myself busy so i'm alone a lot but i'm rarely lonely and and because i refuse to uh, identify with a depressing feeling. You know, there's too much going on in my life. So when we look at alone, loneliness, isolation, separation, we really have to define what they mean and, 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 and understand that one is not necessarily indicative of another. Yeah, thank you for sharing that and and drawing those parallels and conclusions and connections there. Really appreciate it. A question from Eli from our uh, live audience. Eli asks, how do you work your program on a daily basis? Great question. Thank you, Eli, for being a part of the recovery community. Um, you know, every day, um, and I was I, I took on a new person to sponsor just the other day. I met him at a meeting. And and we were talking about approach to recovery. You know, I um, I practiced the the twelve steps of recovery. You know, every every day, um, I do steps ten, eleven, and twelve. It's it's rather simple for me. Um, fortunately, I was introduced to a group of people who understood the simplicity of recovery. And, and once we get past that initial phase where that physical sensation to act out is displaced by a spiritual way, a new way of living, um, then everything else is, is to practice. You know, as we would look at step 10, Eli, I look at and the first word in step 10 is continued. So it's making the assumption that I've already done steps one through nine or the other inventory steps, which are pretty much all of them. And I continue to do that. Step 10 is really interesting in that it's an annual, a semi-annual and periodic. You know, as my sponsor Will would say, if we clear away the wreckage of our present, there won't be any wreckage of our past. You know, and, and that's what I do on a daily basis. Um, step 10, um, illustrates or, or magnifies my humanity that I don't do anything without the power of God, which leads me to step 11, 
where I sought through prayer and meditation to improve that conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out, which is a great transition into step 12. One of the things that I did in one of my podcasts, it was called Solving for Me, God, and Others. And Eli, if we focus on those three things, what is about me that needs to be looked at and fixed? Going to our higher power to fix them and then taking that which is fixed and sharing it with others who are looking to be fixed, right? Because we all come in broken to one degree or another. Some are more broken than others. Some are like Humpty Dumpty, right? All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Well, I'm here to tell you that there is no one who's any more broken than me. And if we, I can be put back together and others that I've known can be put back together because there's some other stories that I hear that are pretty devastating. I'm so grateful I didn't have to go through what they went through. But it's just living out the steps. So wherever you're at in your program of recovery, I still have a sponsor. I still go to meetings. I still read my recovery material. I still pray every day to my higher power. And I still do steps 10, 11, and 12. And that's how I live out my program. And I stay accountable to other people. I'm accountable to Justin. Justin knows me enough and he knows about my family. Justin knows that anytime he sees something about my life that is not consistent with my verbal message, that he has the right to call me out and say, hey, brother, you're a program, you're a person of recovery, you're sharing a message. There's something that I see about you that's not consistent. So accountability is a big deal also. We need to find people that we are accountable to and allow them access in our life so they can tell the things to us that my ego doesn't want to admit. I love that. And thank you, Robert. Um, and, and I love having those network, the network of people around me that can also call me on my garbage when I'm yeah. stepping out of line. Uh, and I'm grateful that you are one of those people too in my life. Um, a little bit of housekeeping on this. One of our, actually a couple of our participants are asking how they can listen to this later as they may need to jump out early or to want to listen to it again because of the power of the share. Uh, all of Rico 12 meetings are recorded and on any podcast platform you can find. You can also go to Rico12.com and find any of the old ones as well as this one will be up within a couple of hours after we're done recording and you can listen on any of those podcast platforms. I'm so grateful to have you all here today and, and for that. Um, Another thing was, Robert, you mentioned your podcast, and I want to give that a shout out, and I'll also put this in the show notes. Uh, oh, your podcast you. is called The Recovery Guy, and uh, fantastic, and I'm so grateful that uh, you had me on as a guest last year at some point yeah. to have a really cool conversation. So uh, fantastic uh, podcast, The Recovery Guy. Um, is there anything else about that podcast that you would like to, to explain that is beyond what I just shared? You know, uh, you can also find, thank you for that. And I, and I appreciate the shameless plug. Uh, uh, also at recoveryguy.org, um, I also have about 150 blogs. Um, and I also have this dear friend named Susie, and she's an Al-Anon. And she's done the 12 steps of Al-Anon uh, on a blog format. And also Real Recovery Guy on YouTube as well. So major podcast channels, um, recoveryguy.org. Um, and then also Instagram, where you can message me, recovery underscore guy. Um, so there's a lot of different formats. I, I don't do TikTok. I don't do Twitter. Uh, they're uh, not not for me. Uh, but the other social media platforms. Uh, and feel free to message me. Just reference this talk, uh, reference uh, Rico12 uh, and Justin, and uh, remind me of our conversation. And I'll get back to you within 24 hours if you have a recovery question or concern. Uh, that uh, you might want a, a, a different uh, twist on. Awesome. And I will post links to all of those resources in the show notes of the podcast. And, uh, um, and I hope everybody gains some great information and great insights out of those. All right. Another question from our live audience, Dory. Dory says, thank you for talking about this topic. Loneliness was and still is something my ego wants relief from. How do you use your program and higher power when the feelings of loneliness come? I assume it still comes now and then. It does for me, even if it's not in obvious forms always. So how do you deal with that when loneliness rears its ugly head? How do I, how do you turn, how do you recognize it first and then turn to connection? You know, that is, that is something that I'm still working on. 
um, because there's there's nothing worse than coasting in recovery. And we continue to work, we continue to strive. Um, I think everything, it was Lori, correct? It was Dory. Dory, Dory my apologies. Dory, um, thank you for that question. And, and, it, and it actually causes me to, to make sure I give you the most qualified uh, viewpoint that I can, because this is really important. I think you, I think you really got to the crust of what this is all about. Um, I believe that, and Justin and I talked about this in the past, um, I believe that recovery is inside out. I believe that even though it's important for others to view me as a person of recovery, I believe if my perspective is on the external, I miss the most important piece, which is the internal. And the internal is my relationship with my higher power. Now, I'm a Christian, uh, so I have a very specific approach to my personal devotion and meditation, which is very different than my 12-step um, approach. Uh, because one of the things that we never want to occur is anyone to feel that they have to believe in a particular God to achieve sobriety. That's the furthest thing from the truth. Matter of fact, if they would have told me early on that it was this perspective or that perspective, the Judeo-Christian or a Jesuit or whatever it was, I'd have run the other way as quickly as possible. But you allowed me the latitude to have a power greater than myself, providing it made sense. Having used that as the framework, Dory, it says in the big book, and this is where developing a relationship with God as you understood God is so important. It says in the big book on page 164, it says our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. But it's interesting. So it's it's encouraging us to have a relationship with God. The, the line before that, in the paragraph before that, it says, remember that your real reliance is always upon him. Here, here's the sentence. He will show you how to create the fellowship that you crave. He will show you. So I don't know how you, for Dory, make those pieces fit. But I know your higher power has got the perfect plan for you and to show you how to create the fellowship that you crave. Because you're male, you're female and I'm male. I don't know what your ethnicity is. I don't know what your religious background is. I don't know what your socioeconomic background is. Therefore, there may be some pertinent distinctions between you and me that the fellowship you crave could be specifically, gen, it's generally the same as me, but it may have some intricacies about it that don't affect me. But your higher power is your higher power, and no one knows you better than the God of your understanding. So the Bible says to seek ye first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the short answer is, go, to, go on your knees to your power greater than yourself, and he will show you how to create the fellowship that you crave. I love that, and I love that, uh, that line from there, creating the fellowship I crave, having God create the fellowship that I crave. He, yeah. God will put into my path everything that I need to be sufficient for my needs for that day. He'll put the connection that I need out there if I'm willing to reach for it, if I'm willing to turn to it, and it will always be there. I, I have not yet been abandoned when I was searching. Now, I have felt abandoned many mm -hmm. times in my life because I expected, I expected the answer to just land in my lap yeah, without turning my head or anything. Um, 
and uh, what a beautiful concept that is and, and, and experiences I have now to where whenever there's something that comes up that, hmm, whether it's a resentment, whether it's a feeling that I loneliness, whether it's fear, if I just turn a little bit and say, God, where is the light? Where is the solution? Yeah. Where is the next connection? Where is the next step towards peace? It's always there if I'm willing to just turn a little bit and look for it. You know, and and I, you know, it, it's interesting, not by accident, that that how it works, chapter five in the big book, is followed by chapter six called into action. You know, and at some point, we need to act upon that which is God is directing without without action. Even the word be, to be, which would appear to be a sedentary word where I'm just sitting by myself and and sedentary. If you understand the word be, to be, it implies action. And if you look it up grammatically in dictionary.com, it will tell you. So another word in, in so I, I have a piece which tells me I don't have to do anything, but yet I need to take action on where God is directing me to have that fulfillment. And Dory, one of the things that I do that's really important at 36 plus years, I still go to meetings. I'm, I like Zoom and, you know, COVID-19 changed the social dynamic of, 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 of how we connect. But in my opinion, nothing replaces me getting a hug from you or me hugging you or me holding hands at the end of the meeting and a sense of belonging and that sense of community and camaraderie. You know, in page 17 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, the chapter is called There's a Solution. It says, the passengers, the moment after rescue from shipwreck, when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. But unlike the feeling of the ship's passengers, however, that joy and escape from disaster does not subside as we go our own individual ways. That camaraderie that's talking about is talking about a unity. You know, the first tradition of Alcoholics Anonymous and all 12-step programs is our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon a, a unity. And not just a spiritual unity, but a physical unity. I think meetings are very important. It's where I just met this, this person I'm sponsoring now. I met him at a meeting. He heard me share. He came up to me after a meeting. He gave me a hug. He shook my hand. He said, I liked what you said. Can essentially, will you be my friend? And of course. And I don't, and I think the impact of him and me meeting in person helped you understand reciprocation. Reciprocation is when I say something to you and you receive and you respond it. And, and that happens with the human connection. We are created by our creator as social beings. And social media doesn't cut it. There's social media recovery is only a temporary fix. I need, I want that human contact. So meetings are critical, especially if you're new or relatively new. Thank you, Robert. And I have a an experience and a thought here that I'd like to get your feedback on that kind of relates to that, but also relates to uh, solitude, being alone, but not lonely. <clears throat> as I look back, uh, and this conversation opened this up to my memory, as I look back at my life for most of my life, especially my young adult life and into my late 30s, um, I fantasized about getting off into a cabin all by myself about getting out there alone. Um, <laughs> but the purpose for doing that was not to connect with nature, not to connect with God, not to connect with, you know, others. It was to isolate, to act out, to, yeah. to binge, to, to, to whatever, and just go wild for however long I could be alone in that process. Now is, and I, I now still, crave might be too, too strong a word, but I still crave that idea of getting out by myself for a couple of days. But now the reasoning for it, the motivation behind it is to connect, 
to, mm-hmm. to be quiet and just enjoy nature, enjoy the solitude, enjoy connection with God and with myself and with creation. Um, how, how do you see that, um, um, relating to what you just shared? Hey, this physical human interaction of, of that, how, how can one enjoy solitude in a healthy way, as well as connection with others? Does that, does that make sense? You know, it does. Um, I, in the beginning, I was around people because I needed to be around people. And, and it's kind of like mistaking sex for love. Um, one is, one is driven from, one is derived from another, but one is not necessarily indication of the other. In the beginning, I was around others because I, it's like taking a drink of water, and we discussed this earlier. I realized how thirsty I was. So I went back to these meetings because that's where people who accepted me were. But I realized at some level, I was going to need to contribute. I was going to need to give back. And so in the beginning, I went because of what you did for me. And then I realized that I had something to offer. And I started going because I had a message of hope to share. Um, and I and I go as an obligation, as a spiritual obligation, because you know it says you can't you can't give away what you haven't gotten, and if you don't give it away, you don't get to keep it. So there are times when I enjoy the solitude and the quietness of my home, and I just sit and I kick the the stool up, and I just close my eyes and I meditate and I just reflect on things and and how beautiful quietness is because I can be quiet and not be lonely. And there are other times where, once again, I'm spiritually mandated to share this and therefore I need to go to where the people are who are hoping for individuals such as me to go and share. And, and I'm not saying this because I think I'm special. I've just been fortunate to be around a long time. I think newcomers need to see me. I think newcomers who are 30, 60, 90, a year, two years, three years, I think they need to see, and I know many people who go to meetings who are 30, 35, 40, 45 years, I know guys 50 years sober and still going to meetings. I think I think it's necessary they see us just as it was necessary that I saw them when I first came into recovery. But your question is is really interesting. I really tonight I'm going to start on on a Zoom meeting. I'm starting a, a weekly Friday night meeting called As Bill Sees It, which is a which is a book that compilation of things Bill wrote a long time ago. Um, but page 228 it says the beginning of true kinship, and I think it speaks to what you were talking about. It says when we teased AA and for the first time in our lives stood among people who seemed to understand. The sense of belonging was tremendously exciting. We thought the isolation problem had been solved. But we soon discovered that while we weren't alone anymore in a social sense, we still suffered many of the old pangs of anxious apartness. Until we had talked with complete candor of our conflicts and had listened to someone else do the same thing, we still didn't belong. Step five was the answer. It was the beginning of true kinship with God and with man. And that is, once again, the answer to all of this, again, alone is a physical presence. It usually means the absence of others. Loneliness is a spiritual longing. It's that, it's that, that God-shaped hole. And I make no apologies for talking about God. Matter of fact, in the big book, it says we're going to talk about God and we don't apologize for any of it. Because unless a person, this is my 12-step opinion, you can agree or disagree. It's not going to change my gratitude whatsoever or my completeness or my happiness whatsoever. If you don't develop, if we don't develop a relationship 
with a power greater than ourself, any sobriety we have will be short-lived and or precarious and will never be complete. Because anything external is only temporary. Only that which is internal, which is the relationship with God as, as we understood him. And it's not who God is, it's what God does. That's the important. It's the attributes of God, not the definition of God. Because you and I were both Christians, but we practice a different approach to our Christianity. Yet, I can go to my Jewish brothers and sisters, or those who, who are Muslim, or those who, who are a natural, you know, they believe in the tide, they believe in, um, in, a, in, a, in a Buddhist fashion. We, our higher power does the exact same thing for us, although we would identify differently as who that higher power is. So we don't have to agree on who God is, but it's important that we agree on what God does because it says in the big book, we are sure, we are sure that God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. And if your higher power isn't giving you that avenue of happiness, joyousness, and freedom, maybe, maybe you're tapping into the wrong power. Maybe you need to talk to Justin or me or find someone at a meeting or talk to your sponsor. Because if you're not finding a new freedom and a new happiness, you're probably not working the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever program you're in, OA, GA, SA, EA. I've, I've been to them all. I qualify for them all. Awesome. So uh, thank you for sharing that. And Robert, uh, please send email me right after this meeting, the link and the information for that as Bill sees it zoom meeting, oh, sure. and I'll put it in the show notes of the podcast so that uh, anybody can access that. I, I, I hope to jump in on that meeting here, whether tonight or in the next couple of weeks, because yeah. that sounds very interesting. Um, oh, shoot. It's gone. Anyways, there was a question that I had for you based on what you just shared there, and it is it is gone. But um, man, I'm sure grateful for that that share that you just gave us there. Um, the so, so before we part here, do you have any additional words of wisdom that you would like to share with us? And maybe my question will come back as you're sharing those words of wisdom. You know, there are some things that we can practically do. Um, one of the things in terms of dispelling loneliness, because a lot of times, um, again, being alone is oftentimes a choice. Sometimes today I'll be alone. Other times today I won't be alone. As I do my work around my house, you know, shovel some snow. I'm, a, I'm alone when I do those things, but I'm never lonely. Later on today, I need to go to the jeweler. I'm going to go to a hardware store. I'm going to make a couple stops. And I won't be alone. And I won't be lonely either. Um, there are some things that we can do uh, practically, um, purposely, um, to dispel loneliness. Because that's the real danger. Again, being alone, I can be as fulfilled as can be. However, in order for me to share my message of hope, I need to be around others. And it's my obligation to God as I understood God. And, and it is an obligation um, of joy. But one of the things that I can do, what we can do is to practice gratitude. Gratitude is the avenue to sobriety. Quickly, I'll tell you a story of Texas, uh, Russian Ted. I was early in my sobriety. And, and Russian Ted was a very stoic individual, dark, thick rimmed glasses, had a goatee, looked very serious, very, very, rarely shared. But when he did, you knew to listen because he was 20 plus years. And I was probably 90 days at the time. I remember walking to the Alana Club in Las Vegas. By the way, folks, I got clean and sober and away from pornography and all those things in Las Vegas, Nevada. 
and sobriety is everywhere, um, providing we're ready. So I walk into Texas Ted or Russian Ted, and I text. I was getting confused with Texas Mike. Everybody had a nickname, Pete the Greek, um, Abe the Plumber. Uh, so I walked up to Russian Ted, and I started telling him about how crappy my day was. And he let me go on for two or three minutes, longer than usual. And, and when I got done with everything, he looked at me and he said, but are you grateful? <laughs> and I looked at him like, old man, are you out of your freaking mind? I just told you what a crap my day was. And you want to know if I'm grateful? And before I could respond, he said, depending upon how grateful you are today will determine the quality and the quantity of your sobriety tomorrow. And he turned around and he walked away. That must, might be the, the most he ever said to me in my entire time with him. But early on, I knew I had to practice being grateful no matter what. I was grateful. Do you know why? Because it wasn't out there acting out anymore. I was in the rooms of hope. And for that, I will always be grateful. Another, another thing is to call someone. Often calling someone, we understand our value. So we automatically go from alone to not being alone. And when we understand the value that we bring to others or others bring to us, it's very important in dispelling loneliness. So call in a friend. Get outside, be active. You know, recovery is not a sedentary process. It's a process of action. You know, even Newton's law of motion, the first law of motion is to things that are in motion tend to stay in motion. Things that are at rest tend to stay at rest. So get outside, get active. Another good thing, Justin, is to talk about our feelings. You know, I'm only as sick as my secrets. Now, some people they don't share everything with. Obviously, Laura, I do, and my sponsor, I do. Um, but I, but I talk about my feelings, you know, it says our stories, des our, our stories describe in a general way, what we used to be like, what happened and what we are like now. So talking about our feelings, cause we only are as sick as our secrets. Another good thing is take a break from social media. My God, get out, be with real people, social media. You know, I take people's word that they're okay. But social media is only going to take me so far. Social media only provides a particular connection for a particular moment. Again, I, I did a podcast on social media recovery. It's a myth. I need human connection. I have a component in me that says, I need you to hug me. And I need to hug you. I need to look you in the eye, face to face, across a cup of coffee and tell you everything is going to be okay. And I need to hear from you and see you face to face. Another thing, remind yourself it isn't permanent. You know, sometimes we mistake alone for loneliness and we'll take our being alone for being lonely. What's wrong with me? How come I can't? Sometimes things are temporary. Sometimes we're in God's waiting room for certain things. And we need to tell ourselves that this too shall pass. And we need to be a person of action. And finally, reach out for help. You know, I have a tattoo for suicide prevention. It's, it's the semicolon that indicates grammatically a pause. Pause long enough to reach out to someone. I need to know if you're lonely. Because I can, I can, I can help bridge that gap for you. Again, going back to we're only as sick as our secrets. When I reach out for help and I say I'm afraid, I don't know if I can do this. I don't understand this. Would you please help? I'm reaching out. And not only am I reaching out so you can help me, but I'm reaching out, allowing you to help. See, we have value. Just because I'm reaching out doesn't mean I'm not providing something. Every teacher needs a student. It lends credibility, viability. And every 
student needs a teacher. You know, oftentimes it's said, and I'll close with this, that the newcomer is the most important person in the room. That's not true. The truth is, if we believe that the newcomer is the most important person in the room, then we believe that the rooms of recovery are like a giant furnace that needs new coals to keep it going. The fact is, those of us who have been around for a while need to do everything we can for ourselves so that there will be someone here when the newcomer arrives. So I need you to reach out for help because I'm spiritually obligated to help. And within that relationship, we dispel being alone and we solve for loneliness. The Bible says that where two or three are joined together, there I will be in the mix. There's a product called Synergy. It's a scientific principle that when one component is added to another component, a third more powerful component is created. And that is the power of God. And only the power of God can dispel my loneliness and to place it, replace it with having value. Love it. Thank you so much, my friend, Robert. Good, good stuff. That was a great RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting for all addicts and those who wanting to learn more about addiction and the recovery therefrom. If we didn't get to your question or if you have other questions, please, please consider joining our WhatsApp community by sending an email with your WhatsApp number to rico12pod at gmail.com. Then you can ask those questions, answer others' questions, provide support to each other through that. But as Robert said, social media connection is counterfeit. Get out there and hug somebody else. Get out yeah. there and be somebody that can, somebody can hug. Good stuff. I invite the audience to come back next week. If you have not yet rated and reviewed the podcast and Apple podcast, please go do so now. It's a great way to work your step 12 and sharing this message with others. And next week, we will be hearing from Tim M, who gave an amazing talk that I heard through one of the message boards that I'm on. And he agreed to come and talk to us on the topic of being sponsorable and sponsoring others. I'm looking forward to it. Now let's launch off into the rest of our day with the step three prayer that Robert will say for us. Have at it, Robert. You know, real quick, uh, when I came back after my relapse and I met my sponsor in the room, essentially he said, are you ready? I said, I am. He said, get on your knees because we're going to do the third step prayer. And it was a launch into my sobriety as I know it today. So God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my, my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Robert. Keep coming back, everybody. It works when I work it. So work it. You are worth it.
See?